Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Renaissance webinar. Um, we are pleased to have you here and uh, hopefully to share some of it, which can then take on to invest to us too to help them. So, uh, like the uh, webinar is themed, we have um, to build a cybersecurity response. Uh, capability among the main institutions. And uh, this is an effort from Greensat uh, to actually build that capacity among the institutions. Uh, so um, they will prepare uh, a topic for which is basic incident response uh, to help you get your technical skill uh, to do this kind of work uh, before you probably escalate to someone else. So on the panel, we have a uh, video in Congo. Who's going to take us through this uh, day and um, hope to have an interactive session with all uh, for discussion as well? So, um, without further ado, let's um, uh, keep, uh, take us through. Keep, uh, okay, thank you, William. Good morning, everyone. I hope everybody had a good night and welcome to the Renaissance webinar 2023, the first day. The theme is going to be uh, building basic incident response know-how so that uh, our members are able to respond to incidents that occur before they're, they're escalated to the Renaissance or any other helping body. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, uh, someone can give me a nod if all of you can see my screen. We can see your screen. Can you? Okay, perfect. Uh, so like I said, the topic for today is going to be building cybersecurity response capability in our constituency. And like my colleague William introduced already, my name is Gideon Pungu, and I'm a cybersecurity engineer trainer, a member of the Renaissance. Our outline today, we are going to discuss an event versus an incident, that is understanding what an event is, what an incident is. We're going to discuss the incident response process so that we properly understand what it entails, what is what goes where, what comes at what stage, and how they intertwine with each other. Then we'll have a bit of a practical session where we'll investigate an incident, show you how back at home or back at your member institution, how you would be able to investigate an incident using examples. Then we'll head to prevention strategies, show you that, okay, now that you know how to respond to an incident, how do you prevent it from happening in the first place? Then we'll talk about recovery and review. How do you recover from an incident when it does occur? Uh, before we proceed with our slides, I'm going to ask a question and try to, to see what our knowledge on the subject is. So you can go ahead and type in the chat what comes to mind when you hear the word incident. You as uh, an, an attendee in this webinar today, before we discuss anything, when you hear the word incident or an incident, what comes into your mind? Please go ahead and um, write some answers in the, in the chat so that we can discuss before we continue. Uh, 
Um, we have a hand from a few people. Um, Olivia, we have TikTok. Uh, I think someone has made a comment that uh, the chat is disabled. I think my colleague William can go ahead and enable the chat so that uh, our attendees can answer the question. Let me do that on the right. Once again, the question is, what comes into your mind when you hear the word incident? Uh, everyone should be able to chat now. All right, thank you, William. Uh, is anybody else having the problem accessing the chat or? Yes, the answers are coming in. I have an answer from Mugumia who says, I understand an incident as an attack or a breach. Musime says, um, it's an instance of something happening. Brian says, an incident is an unexpected event. Rachel says, an incident is a situation that happens outside the normal operations. Ray says, an incident is something that has or is bound to occur. Shahali says something unexpected happening. And finally, an incident that occurs is unexpected in manner. So that is very good. It shows that uh, our audience has an understanding of what an incident, an incident actually is. So let's continue and discuss. So these definitions, the definitions that I'm giving today are not written in stone. It's a discussion where consensus can be had by different people, but for the purposes of this uh, webinar, we're going to say that an incident is an observed change to normal behavior of a system, environment, process, workflow, or person, right? Any observed change to normal behavior you know that this is how my system is supposed to function and any observed change would be an event. An example would be um, if somebody was to update the firewall policy, that is, an that is an event, actually we're discussing an event. If somebody were to update the firewall policy, that would qualify as an event. If somebody was to um, update the, the router access control list, that would still be an event. Right, but on the other hand, an incident is a human caused malicious event that leads, leads to or may lead to a significant disruption in business, right? An example could be an attacker posting credentials firm that they got from your company online, an attacker changing uh, uh, some things in your system or maybe changing credentials to your system and locking you out putting malware in your system that qualifies as an incident, right? So we're going to have um, a small poll on that to see if uh, our audience can tell the difference between an event and an incident. Because usually when something happens, right, in cybersecurity, 
it's very important for you to be able to tell the difference between whether it's an event or an incident, because that determines how much time and resources you should put into investigating it or solving it, because you might waste a lot of time, but it's just a normal event. So it's important to know whether it's an incident or an event. So we're having a simple question. A lecturer input a student's marks for an exam into the record system. Is that an event or an incident? Please go ahead and take the poll. And our second question, you can see that we have a poll made up of three questions. So just go ahead and answer all of them. Our first question is, a lecturer input a student's max for an exam into the record system. Is that an event or an incident? Our second question is, a teacher change the student's max for an exam in the record system. Is that an event or an incident? And the last one is, a college principal change the student's GPA for the current semester. Is that an event or an incident? Our answers are for all three questions. You either don't know it's an event, an incident, or both. Okay, so far 28% of our audience has participated. Please go ahead and take the poll. I think when we get to around 60%, uh, we'll discuss the results of our poll. And if we come up with an answer or a consensus as, uh, as members of the webinar, and you don't agree with your colleagues, you can let us know why you think the answer is the opposite of what the majority has agreed to. Okay, we are almost at the three minute mark. Please, if you haven't yet finished the poll, this is your chance. Okay, our poll has ended. So, our, quest, our first question, once again, was a lecturer input a student's marks for an exam into the record system. Is this an event or an incident? 84% of us said it's an event. 16% said it's an incident. So this is an event, right? Because a lecturer is teaching and editing this course. So if they input max for this particular student into the record system, this is an expected chain of events. This is something that's expected to happen into the system. They're supposed to enter a student's max. So this is an event, right? So that was a, a pretty clear one. The second question was a teacher change the student's max for an exam in the record system. Is this an event or an incident? This is a bit tricky. This was the tricky one. So 32% of us say it's an event, and 62% uh, of us say it's an incident. And 5% say it's both. Before we reveal what the answer is, uh, is it possible to have um, a representative from one representative from one of those three answers to tell us one, to tell us why they think it's an event? Another to tell us why they think it's an incident and one to tell us why they think it's both. Um, we have an, a hand from Moses Perahanga. Perhaps you can speak on that. Okay, Moses, you can go ahead and... Uh... 
Hello? Hello? Are you able to hear, uh, hear me? Yes, you can, Moses. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Maybe you could uh, bring back the question, but um, for me, I think it is an incident because um, this teacher is performing a change. We uh, maybe we might not know whether he's changing it um, uh, with bad intentions or with good intentions, but this is a change that has been caused by a human uh, or it is caused by a human. And maybe somewhere, somehow, is not expected to have changed. Maybe it's, it's paid to change that. Maybe it's, we can't tell. But all of a sudden, the max has been changed in the system. So I really hope that this should be an event. Sorry, this should be a, an incident because it has a, a, a changed the system value and is caused by a human. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moses. Um, I agree that it's quite tricky whether <laughs> someone is changing because of good or bad intention. But, um, yeah, um, I, would, I would also see that you are both it that way and also we can do it. We have a hand from Jekoti. Yes, we have the hand okay. from Jekoti. Jekoti, okay. uh, Thank you very much, William, and, uh, and, the, and our trainer for today. I want to agree with Moses about uh, the question that it is an incident. Uh, personally, I also answered incident because the lecturer is inputting, uh, is cha they're changing the marks. So if they change the marks, there's going to be a significant change. That change is even going to interrupt the, ne the next question because it's going to affect, significantly affect the, the GPA of the student. So there are, for me, I took it from the perspective of the significant disruption in terms of it's, uh, it's either the mark, is, the change of the mark is either going to affect the student and negatively by reducing the, the GPA, or it's going to be positively by uh, changing, uh, positively changing, increasing the GPA. So it, like Moses said, it may not be malicious. We don't know if the person is doing it maliciously, but there is a significant disruption in the map or in the, in the GPA as well. I don't know if my, question, my answer again touches to question number three, but to me, I agree that it's an incident because it is changing the overall grade of the student. I submit, William. Thank you very much, Jokoti. Um, I think I can take two more questions uh, before we move on to the remainder. Let's have one from Rachel. Rachel, can go ahead and speak. Okay, um, thank you very much, everyone, for organizing this. So for me, I'm a Magda Gaze who answered it's an event, basically because earlier I would say that an event is an observed change from the normal behavior. So I'm thinking that the normal behavior was the original marks that were actually entered in by the lecturer. Then um, the change we see, the change that he made for the second question, um, it's, I'm thinking it's the observed change from the original that we are intervening. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Um, one more. Yeah, from Julius. Julius, can go ahead and speak. Uh, thank you, uh, William. Uh, for me, I think this is an event. I know that uh, most of the members are saying that it is unclear, but uh, to me it is clear because normally I would expect a lecturer to have that privilege of uh, changing or modifying marks. If this was a student changing marks, then clearly we can say that that is an incident because it is abnormal. 
under normal circumstances, students are not supposed or they don't have that privilege of changing marks. But uh, clearly, this is a lecturer, so would assume, or it is universally assumed that a lecturer can change, modify marks. So that is why I'm saying this is an event, not an incident. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julius. Um, okay, you thank you for one? everyone. If we can take it. Okay. Yes, we can take one more question or one more answer. Mobina no man. Um, you can go ahead and speak. It's the best, uh, Hello. Hello. Yes, no man. Go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. I I personally answered uh, this to be an incident, but when you closely look at um, our two definitions for an event and incident, you want to look at this in two dimensions. It can either be an event or an incident, since uh, the two would ultimately affect the results positively or negatively. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Um, back to you, Gideon. Uh, this shows that uh, we are really uh, resilient and we are following along properly. So those last two questions were meant to be confusing intentionally because these are the kind of scenarios that you will actually be dealing with at your member institutions, right? The first one was pretty clear that since this is the lecturer, they're allowed to change marks. For the second one, for those that say it's unclear, that's correct, right? Because if a teacher is changing a student's marks, right? If a teacher was entering marks, you expect that since they're the teacher, they're allowed to check to enter them. But if they're changing marks, you have to ask that since marks have already been entered and they are now being changed, is this teacher allowed to change the marks for this course, right? So you'd have to first identify if this teacher is the one that is auditing this course and are they allowed to change the marks? Because if, let's say it's, um, yes, they're a teacher of, let's say, computer science, but they're not the ones that audited this particular course, you as a sysadmin would have to be aware of this as an incident because this could be a teacher that is malicious, maliciously changing math for a student, right? But if it is the teacher that audited the course in the first place, maybe they could have made a mistake in the mark. So this would be an event, right? So it's very important to you to pay attention to those small details, right? And finally, for a college principal that changed a student's GPA for the current semester, is this an event or an incident? Most of our audience said it's an incident, right? I don't know if uh, we have enough time to take maybe just two, two people and strictly two people to tell us why they think it's an incident and why they think it's an event. One for incident, one for event, before we continue. Okay, we have Chakot submitting us again. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, William and colleague. Uh, for me, I also answered it as an incident because uh, uh, I still had an issue about the, the, the second question, because uh, if I can be allowed to submit briefly on that and then I go to the, the third question. The, the second question for me, I was reasoning it from the perspective, I've even put it on, it, on, on the message, is that first of all, in an academic institution, the core of academia is where academics and marks and marks determine if a student is progressing to the next level. Now, I like you, you, the facilitator had reasoned it out. Yes, this lecturer entered the marks. By the time he entered the marks and submitted the marks, that meant that the results were binding by that time. So what is causing him to change the mark later? It is what brings the question. And that, for me, it looks to be a security incident, an issue that is going to cause disruptions in the overall mark. So 
I, I, in my text, I said it has to be really justified. And going back to question number three, the, call, the, 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 the head, the principal has nothing to do with the marks. It's not the one who taught, it's, it's not even the quality assurance. So for me, it's an incident because he's going to, if he's going to do that, what is, it, what is going to happen? It's going to disrupt, cause a disruption because if college principals are, keep changing the marks, then it's going to, maybe it's going to do it to favor another student. So it's it's an incident because it's not even in, it's not supposed to be it's not the academic register even anyway to handle marks. So for me, it will be an issue. I submit. Thank you very much, Shekwati. One more person. One more person. I don't know if we still have another hand that's raised. Henry. We have Henry. Henry, Henry yes. Henry, can yes. you speak? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, based on the explanations that uh, we've uh, we've received from the different speakers, I must say that uh, for the second one, the second question, I think it's both an event and an incident, because in the first place, there's a change in the system by the input of the marks by the lecturer. And then it becomes an incident if that change is uh, bad or good. So for that question, I think it's both an event and an incident. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. And the last question or? Should be glad. Yeah, it was the last. Okay. Okay. This was an amazing uh, discussion. Thank you for being an engaging audience. So for the last one, like uh, our uh, former colleague uh, discussed, the college principal. Yes, this he or she is a principal, but they have no business dealing with students' marks, right? They're not the academic registrar, they're not the lecturer. Typically, they, they don't interact with the student's marks at all. So them changing a student's GPA is suspect, right? So this would qualify as an immediate incident, right? And for the second question, like the last colleague said, it could qualify as both. Like I said, it depends. If the lecturer is the one that is auditing the course, then that could be an event, right? But if it's maybe a different lecturer, it could be an incident. So for a scenario like that, and like uh, our colleague Ramadan said, when a lecturer enters Max in the first place, right? That is not suspect at all. But when they come and change it, usually you as a systems admin, you have to be suspect, right? Because you have to go and ask them or find out why they are changing these marks in the first place, even if they are the ones who enter these marks in the first place. There has to be a reason why they are changing that mark. So that is why it's a bit, uh, it's a bit of a tricky um, scenario where it's up to you to decide whether it's an event or an incident. So it could be both. So yes, um, uh, that is the end of our first poll. And let us continue, unless someone has any, any other submission. I think we can continue. So now that we understand properly what an event is and what an incident is, and we can tell the difference between the two, right? Our next uh, part of our webinar is to understand what the incident response process is. If an incident does occur, what's this process right and uh, before we continue you have to know that this process is cyclic or it's recursive every stage of this process fits into each other and as you go ahead and read after this webinar as you make your own research you find that different people use different jargons for different uh, stages of this process right someone might not call, call it detection and analysis someone might call it something else but as long as you understand the basics of this process or the basics of the different steps, you always be able to um, know what they're talking about. But for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to say that this process is, comp is comprised of four 
of four stages, right? That feed into each other as you see that form a loop. And that first stage is using preparation, which is in most cases the most important part of the incident response process, which is preparation, which I'll advise that right after this webinar, you go and do this very state preparation. This is an involves um, taking actions to prepare your organization or your school or your institution before an incident occurs, right? Uh, doing a network audit, uh, system audit, doing asset inventory, asset management, doing security awareness for your staff so that an incident doesn't occur in the first place, right? Setting up an incident response plan for your organization so that they know that in the event that an incident does occur, this is how we handle each other. This is the person that handles this. This is how we communicate to our stakeholders. This is uh, how we isolate the systems, etc., etc. Right. So preparation is often, more often than not, the most important stage of this process. You have to be prepared because in in security, we prepare as best as we can, but that is not guaranteed that the incident will not occur. As you've seen, no matter how much you prepare, something might occur. So you must be prepared to respond to it when it does occur. Right. And then the next stage after preparation if and when it does occur is detection and analysis, right? And here we can break it a bit into, uh, in detection, you're going to identify a potential computer security incident, right? You could um, obtain sources of information, maybe from host computers, maybe network logs, maybe firewall logs. Uh, you could maybe, um, have testimonies from individuals, right? You can talk to members of staff and maybe they can tell you this person left their workstation open and maybe I saw a student come and sit there for 30 minutes. That is all part of the detection process, right? And then part of that very stage is analysis. After you have all this information, are you able to analyze it and make sense out of it, right? You're able to see your logs and be like, okay, for my logs, I can identify that somebody gained access to my system, or I can identify that somebody did change the student's marks. At least, and maybe this is how they're able to gain access, right? And then after this, you're able to do initial response, which is, uh, you know, containment, eradication, and recovery. And this stage is very important, right? Because now you've detected your incident, and you've analyzed and you've identified how it came to occur or that how it's occurring, and now you have to contain it in order for it not to spread further. For example, it's a ransomware incident. You have a, a, an infected horse. You have to be able to contain so that it doesn't spread to the rest of your network, right? And here is um, where you're usually going to maybe isolate that horse, right? Maybe establish some firewall rules, as we'll see later, right? then you go ahead and eradicate the incident altogether. Maybe uh, you can delete the user account, or maybe you can um, uh, remove this host from the network altogether, maybe delete malware, run an anti-malware if you're running a Windows system, uh, etc, etc. And then after that, you undergo recovery, right? And recovery, as we'll see later, has some things that have to already be set up for you to be able to, to occur, like I said. This thing is cyclic, it fits into each other. So as part of preparation, there are things like setting up backups, which will come into play when you have to recover in case an incident occurred, right? And then after that, we'll do post-incident activity where you're going to, uh, part of it will also be recovery, right? Set up making sure that your systems are back and your business is running as normal or institution is running, institutional systems are running as expected maybe sending out uh, communications to all stakeholders, letting them know that everything is okay, reporting, you know, writing, uh, because uh, part of the incident response, it's very important to be able to write a, a very good report, because that report will help you internally in case something similar occurs in the future. It will help you if you have a, a very well-written report, you can present it to an administration to let them know things that you need, or to, you need to set up or things you need to buy and have in place to prevent this incident from occurring in the future. But if you don't have the report and you just, uh, it's just word of mouth, then you might not be able to back up your claims. So as part of course, incident activity, we have a couple of things that need to be done, right? So as you can see, once again, it's a cycle process. So as I've been discussing from uh, the visual that we're using, 
this process usually involves, you know, pre-incident preparation, detection of events of incidents, investigation of the incident, initial response, uh, formulating a, resp a, a response strategy, resolution, and reporting. So before we go ahead to the next stage, uh, do we have any questions on this so far? Is there any questions on the incident response process? You can go ahead and ask now. And we can have a small conversation, a small discussion before we continue. Okay, someone says no question from me. Okay, I'll take that as a sign that everybody's following. Okay, Mugumi and Norman has a question. Okay, Norman, you can go ahead and speak. Norman. Okay, thank you. I think in the first place, I was I was unable to, to unmute myself. My question goes to to you on a, on a, on a third step under containment and eradication, where we have also recovery. What other parameters can we put in place? You mentioned of 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 user of, of deletion of user accounts. What other you know other parameters can we implement to to make sure that that step is also recovered. Thank you. A bit in depth uh, in the next uh, in the next few slides. Okay, I think let's continue and uh, cover it so that people know what you want to say. Okay, so to continue our webinar. We're going to first focus on uh, that stage of the detection and analysis, right? You being able to investigate your incident. And usually this step involves um, determining the who, what, when, and where, and how, and why that is surrounding an incident, right? Let's say, uh, it's like our scenario previously, marks were changed. Who changed these marks, right? Uh, which uh, which course unit was it? When were the marks changed? In which system were they changed? How were they changed? Uh, the why surrounding an incident, you know, why the results were changed. So it's very important when you investigate an incident. And here, this, uh, this stage is usually split into two mini uh, phases, which is data collection and forensic analysis, right? First, you have to collect your data and then analyze it to make sense out of it, right? So to go ahead, uh, we're going to use an incident, right? a brute force incident. And here we have an example of um, a report. I don't know if uh, I hope everyone can see the screen pretty clear. You can see a screenshot that I've shared that shows you an example of a brute force report that was received that says that host this is sending out um, brute force attempts or attacks to other hosts, right? A scenario like this happens where let's say, um, an example would be that uh, you as an admin have, let's say someone compromised a host in your network and then they're using it to send out brute force assisted attacks or brute force attacks on other hosts in other networks, right? So typically how it would start, how would you as admin would identify, because you might ask, how do I know that an incident is occurring? Usually you might receive an, a, a report, right? For example, for this particular incident, for using an example, we received a report that this host is brute force a person on network, right? So what do you tell from this report? You can know that, okay, this is the host that is attacking, right? You get the IP and you see that it's clearly brute forcing other people, right? So you go ahead. So to investigate, right? You've received, you received your report and you know that a host in my network 
is brute forcing people to investigate. There are different kinds of evidence that you can consider. Right? There is network-based ev evidence, right? If you have an IDS, an IDS is an intrusion detection system. If you have an intrusion detection system set up at your member institution or at, uh, at your organization, you can obtain these IDS logs and identify traffic that is coming from that host and review traffic that is coming from that host and try to identify, okay, Hosts with IPA is then has been reported to be sending out, but as me, the sysadmin, what am I seeing in my IDS? Is this really sending out anything or is it just a false positive, right? You can also review or obtain router logs. If you don't have an IDS set up, you can go to your router and get logs and try to identify, is there any traffic maybe coming? What traffic is coming from the port or from the interface? To which this host is connected to see if this is actually true. You can, if you have a firewall set up and logging is enabled, you can obtain firewall logs and still be able to do the same, right? If you have a remote logging set up, let's say you have syslog set up at your institution, you can still obtain those logs and be able to investigate. Or you can perform network monitoring yourself, right? As we will share a few commands in the next slides. You can run commands to see traffic or connections that have been set up between that host. If you have access to, to that host, the traffic or connections that have been set up between that host and other hosts. And that will help you there, you know, investigate and know. Or you can do post based evidence, right? You can go and obtain system time, timestamps. Uh, relevant files to confirm, as we're going to see in the next, um, so to better understand this, the next slide shows us an example, right? For our report that we shared, we had an SSH a brute force report, right? There was a report that some, a, a host in our network was a brute force in someone. So then, as we showed, is that you can go and obtain logs, right? System logs. So we go ahead and obtain our SSH logs, which should exist on our server, right? And then we go and try to do some basic, some basic scanning, right? We do a grab on our SSH logs and try to see if there is any valid user, right? We're just trying to see if anyone was actually in the first place, because we know that if somebody is sending out brute force attempts, right? That means they have access to our system. That means they should have got in somewhere. So we start from home and say that, okay, this is the host. What can we find out from this host? We go to its SSH logs and try to find out if there was any successful attempts or successful access to this particular host that we don't know about, right? And as you can see from the screenshot, you can see that multiple people or same person tried to gain access from IPs that we don't even know using different users, right? You can see that somebody from and at that IP.17 tried with the user admin, then they tried with the user Jake, with the user root, with the user sys admin, user net admin, user web test. So usually uh, why it's important to stay vigilant, especially if you have systems or servers, people out on the internet are always, especially if your service or your server is exposed to the internet, people are always going to try to brute force, right? They're always going to try to gain access to your service access to your server. So that's why it's very important to have strong passwords as we'll see later, some of the strategies. Very important to make sure that you're secure, that it's very hard for somebody to gain access if they're not allowed to have access, right? Because as you can see, people keep trying different usernames and different passwords on your host to get access, right? And from the next screenshot, you can see that unfortunately for this particular host, access had been gained. You can see that we did some, uh, some basic investigation using a few commands that we'll share. And we're able to see that when we grab accepted password, we're able to see that on this server, a user, that means there was a user called Sophia, and somebody was able to brute force their password and gain access to our, to our server, right? So you as a sysadmin, me, you're going through your logs, your SSH logs. First of all, you see that people have been trying to gain access, which is quite normal. But then you're able to grab and uh, and narrow down to only the accepted sessions or accepted access to your server. And then you see that maybe you know that um, at times so-and-so, you, you access to your server. 
maybe an RSS admin access, access server using a particular server, but then you're seeing particular accesses that you don't know about or from a particular IP that you don't know about. You know that maybe you only access, you usually only access your server when you're at work and the IPs for your network usually belong in this range, but you're seeing an IP that you don't expect that was given a session to your server. This is suspect. That is something you can note and you can start your investigation. You can continue your investigation from here. Because as you can see from the screenshot, you can see that that IP is an IP that was not expected was able to use a user called Sophia, which is a legit user on the server to gain access, right? So we can start making some assumptions, not conclusions, but some assumptions that since we don't know this IP, we can assume that maybe an attacker was able to brute force my server using this user Sophia and gain and get the password. Maybe Sophia had a weak password and that's how they gain access to my server. And then you can continue your investigation, right? But this, uh, but this, remember, this is all assuming that you as a sysadmin, you know your network, right? You know the systems that are running on your network. You know what runs where and who has access. Because if you don't know, then the investigation will become harder. Because imagine how you're going to know, how you're going to look at your logs and identify that maybe this person is not supposed to have access. Maybe this person was not supposed to access the server at this time. What is a, a session that's logged from them, maybe from their house, right? You as a sysadmin, knowing the normal state, knowing the normal events of your system will help you identify when an incident occurs, right? So other ways of checking for indicators of compromise, right? Initially, we check maybe SSH logs, server logs, firewall logs, but other ways that you can check uh, indicators of compromise, you can look for unusual processes. If you know that maybe I'm running uh, a server, maybe a student management system or a learning management system, and I know that these are usually the processes that are supposed to run, you know that this service is supposed to run. Maybe I'm supposed to be running Apache in Nginx, maybe I'm running a web server and um, PostFix is supposed to be running. This other service is supposed to be running. You know that these are the normal services that are supposed to be running or normal processes. You can do a, a, a command like ps minus ox to see the services that are running on your system in case you're suspecting that maybe an incident occurred or maybe you're seeing that somebody gained access from the previous screenshot. Then you can go to your processes and maybe you identify that there is a process that you don't know, right? A process that you as a sysadmin do not know of or you did not start. That is somewhere you can start from. You can go ahead and investigate that process further and see what is this process actually running. You might find that it's actually running from a malicious script or it's running some malware that is being used to establish persistence on your system or that is being used to uh, send out these attacks, right? Or that is being used to exfiltrate data, students' data or other data, medical data. From your system right so it's very important to look into processes that are running from your system but as i said remember that that means you're supposed to know what normal function for your system should look like right then you can also look for unusual files right because you know that this is my system these are the files that i have if you go and run a command like maybe find name and then you just print all the files on your system. And then you see some files that maybe don't have any users associated with them. Files that have names that are weird and crooked that you don't understand. That is something you can uh, be suspect of. You can say that, okay, let me investigate this further, right? Who owns these files? Maybe let me ask my fellow sysadmins, did you create this file? If not, then you know that, okay, I'm going to continue the investigation. I'm going to uh, continue that route maybe to go to containment or eradication, right? Then you can also look for unusual network usage, right? You can run an LS of command to see sessions, you see, to see your traffic, to see if any sessions on a particular, using a particular process or using a particular protocol have, have been established that you don't expect, right? Then you can also look for sch scheduled tasks or front jobs, right? Usually uh, on our systems, uh, I'd imagine as systems, I mean, you set up some scheduled jobs, maybe to um, uh, remind you of some activities, maybe to renew certificates, things like that. 
But if you go to, but attackers, usually when they gain access to your system, to establish persistence, because they know that you usually restart your server, they might go and edit your cron tab to add some scheduled tasks so that every time you restart your system, you might think by restarting it will solve a problem, but every time you restart your system, since this person has a cron job running or a scheduled task running, their script will just run and they will be able to gain access once again, right? You can go and check in your cron tab and see if there are any jobs there or any tasks there that are running that you as a system mean did not put there or did not schedule, right? That could be another way to look for suspects in suspect things. You could also look for unusual accounts with root privileges. You can know that maybe I have a Windows server or a Linux server, and maybe I have a root account, an admin account, and maybe a, an audit account on my system. But then as you're checking, let's say there are an event has occurred, or even before an event occurs, but you just, because you're a thorough system admin, which is very good to be thorough, you're checking through your users, and you see a new user that you're not expecting, or a user that has root privileges that you don't think they should have, then you can go ahead and investigate what files does this user have under them, right? Is this user running any suspicious processes? Is this user sending out any suspicious traffic? ETC, ETC, right? And last but not least, keep in mind that this uh, file is not exhaustive, right? We are going to provide some links of different resources that you can follow to make thorough investigations. But for the purpose of this webinar, we're just uh, giving you the basics, right? You can also go and check out unusual SSH keys because usually when, when somebody or an attacker gains access to your machine or your server, they are going to try to establish persistence. So they might go and add a key so that they don't need the password anymore. So that even if you change the password, because usually we think that if somebody gains access to my server and I find out I'm just going to change the password and they will lose access. No, attackers are smart they'll probably go and create a user or even get your very users and add their key to, um, to the authorized keys file. So you might think that, okay, I've found a user and I've deleted them or I've deactivated this user, this person has lost access. Now you have to be thorough and check that even the users I expect to be on this system, let me check their keys. Is there any key that shouldn't be there? If there is, then you know that that is how the person is establishing assistance, right? Uh, do we have any questions thus far? Or we can... And continue. Please, uh, something you want to add or any questions that you want to ask, you can go ahead and let us know. And if I don't see the question in time, my colleague William will already tap me and we can discuss. Okay. Now that you've detected it and we're still analyzing our incident, some, some of the things that we can look at is that you can review volatile data, right? Like we said, you can review network connections, uh, review rogue processes, identify uploaded files, downloaded files that you don't know, review log files, review unauthorized user accounts. So this slide basically uh, summarizes these commands that we talked about, right? Because usually as part of an investigation, the best one is to check, check for any processes that you don't know, any files downloaded or otherwise, network, traffic that you don't get, uh, scheduled tasks, accounts, and, um, and keys, right? But that doesn't mean that that is all. Uh, I see a question in, this, in the chat. Sandra is asking, what are SSH keys? So Sandra, usually um, as a sysadmin, if you have a server that you want to access remotely, right? You don't want to access it through a console. Maybe you want to access it through your PC. Usually you can set up what we call a secure shell connection, right? To establish that secure shell connection, usually you enter maybe the server the username, the IP, the port, and maybe enter the password. But this is unsafe, right? Because usually, um, since no matter how much we preach, uh, we preach the concept of secure passwords, people might forget and have a weak password, right? So, and when passwords are enabled, the attacker might be able to brute force that password and get access to your server. But SSH keys work in a way that a person on their machine generates a, a pair of keys, right? A private key and a public key. 
and then you are, as a sysadmin are able to get a copy of their public key and put it on the server so that the next time they try to access this server using their PC or their machine or their host, they will not be required to enter a password. They will be authenticated based on the, on the other side of that key, which is the private key that is existent on their machine. And that means if the person does not have that private key, they will not be able to access your server. So it's a bit over, over a second layer of security where that you know that on my server, I've deactivated password authentication. For a person to access the server, they need to have their key added by the sysadmin. So it's something that's, uh, that would be very much recommended for servers that are expressly running critical services. Does that answer your question, Sandra? Anybody else with a question? Uh, seems like we're good. Uh, let's continue. Uh, thank you, Sandra. So to show a session analyzing, right? Now we've received a report. We've been able to do some initial investigation, see that somebody gained access to our server, right? Through SSH. And then from what we just said, we want to do a bit of analysis, right? So we run an LS of command to try to identify, since from our report, we know that they told us that somebody was brute forcing someone else from our server, right? We do a, a bit of a network investigation, a network analysis to see what can we tell from connections that have been established, right? So we have a screenshot here and we are going to run a small poll where you ask the audience, properly analyze this screenshot and tell me what, is, what it is trying to say and we discuss. And we see if you are able to, um, if you are able to get access to logs or traffic back at your institution, would you be able to identify what it is trying to say? So there is our poll and it's still going to run for about three minutes. And the question is, according to the example indicator compromise determined by that command, what does our output mean? One, the attacker is running a brute force SSH attempt on a remote service. Two, the attacker has a successful SSH session on the affected host. Remember the affected host is our host in this scenario, right? And then three, it is normal SSH traffic. Please go ahead and take the poll. Again, the first one is the attacker is running a root SSH attempt on a remote service. That means the attacker on our machine, who compromise our machine, is trying to SSH to brute force someone else, right? Using our machine. Number two, the attacker has a successful SSH session and affect us. Uh, host, this says that this uh, the screenshot is showing us that the attacker is a successful SSH session on our host, an affected machine, and three, it is normal SSH traffic. There is nothing wrong with it. Okay, we have around eighteen percent people that have responded so far. Please, it will take you less than five seconds. Go ahead and attempt. Then we will discuss for those who had uh, questions about um, SSH keys. My colleague William has shared a link about um, configuring SSH key based authentication in your server, which is very much recommended as a defense in depth, as a security for your servers, especially those ones running critical services. Because, like we said, if there is no password authentication enabled on your server, that means the attacker would have to have their key on the server or have to first compromise a host that has access to that server. So it, it's making it a bit harder for them. It doesn't mean they will not be able to gain access, but you're making life a bit harder for them, which is always our intention, make life as hard as possible for the attacker. Okay, we have around 44% and uh, we have around 15 seconds left. 
please uh, go ahead and pick the poll. Right, we'll discuss. Be ready. Uh, I think since we have answers for all three, we have representatives from all three. I think uh, as uh, has been tradition, we'll have some people defend each of those answers. So if you've already answered and you feel like you can defend one of those answers, please go ahead and put up your hand so that when the poll ends, we can go ahead and discuss. Norman is asking, okay. It says that the question is according to the example indicator compromise determined by the command pseudo ls of for a port TCP traffic on port 22. What does the output mean? Right. First answer is the attacker is running a brute force SSH account on a remote service. That means since we already identified that the attacker compromised our host. And they're using it for some malicious activity. The first answer assumes that the attacker, that traffic shows that the attacker is running a brute force attempt on another remote service, right? The second one says that the attacker has a successful SSH session on the affected host. The second one just says that it shows that the attacker has a successful SSH session on our host. And the final one shows that it says that this screenshot just shows that. No, it is no more SSH traffic. No man, is it a bit more clear now? Perfect. Uh, so go ahead and answer. When we hit the six minute mark, I think we're going to end our poll. And uh, yes. Our poll has ended. So the results are for our first answer, the attacker is running a brute force SSH attempt on a remote service. What 25% of our voters? The second one, the attacker has a successful SSH session on the affected host. Got 53. So that means uh, a lot of people chose the second one. And finally, uh, it is a normal SSH traffic, but uh, 22 percent of our voters. So do we have any representatives from the audience that want to defend any of those answers? If there is, you can put up your hand and we can discuss. Norman, please go ahead and discuss. And then after that, we'll have Dockers and Anybody else? No, please go ahead. Okay, I go. I go with uh, the first, the first um, entry. That's a uh, an attack is running a brute force, because for me, I am seeing a variance in IP addresses. In that screenshot, that's the only conclusion that I'm able to draw there. Thank you. you can unmute and uh, according yes, to the ahead. screenshot we are able to see 
when a connection is established and when it when it happened and the various IPs that are trying to access through SSH, because the first one, they are trying to access it and the connection is established, meaning it is successful, you can do anything after that. If you see the IP that was trying to access, the 61177 and also another IP with 124, that seems a bit strange compared to the upper ones that were blue listed that are 137, meaning those ones are from the authorized user. These IPs seem very different compared to the ones that we see up out of the screenshot. Perfect, thank you, Douglas. Uh, so Porti, uh, I think you have your hand up as well. You can go ahead. Aramata, thank you. You thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, I, I will, I'm reasoning from the perspective that uh, uh, normal SSH uh, activity takes place on port 22. And our log, uh, when you look at on the top there, we have port 22. So, and you, most, I think most times uh, normal activity takes place in, in, with that port. So for me, I don't see even, because uh, I don't see the public key being shared in this incident. I submit. Okay, thank you, Ramadan. Uh, is there anybody else or uh, can I take over the discussion? No, I think those are the last ones. Okay, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, Dukas, Noman, and Ramadan for uh, representing the rest of the audience. So yes, uh, as run this command, we're trying to identify uh, traffic or sessions that were going on on port 22, which is typically our SSH port, our, our port for SSH, right? And the highlighted section, as Docker said, right? It is showing us which is, was the second response, which means most of our audience was able to analyze it correctly. It is showing us that um, the attacker has established SSH connections with our hosts, right? Of course, in this uh, uh, scenario being instance for T3. And you can see that uh, bizarre IPs that we don't know about uh, 61.177, 124, 255. From their ports 2008 uh, and uh, 35464 have established connections to our instance and port 22. Since, we, as you can see from the command, we are already looking for things that are happening in port 22. So we can see that these people actually, this person or these people, we don't even know if it's one person or different people have established SSH connections or SSH sessions on our hosts. That was uh, the answer. Does anyone have uh, questions, additions, subtractions before we continue? Or are we good to go? You can just uh, send me, uh, go ahead in the chat and we'll continue. All right, thank you, Ramadan. Uh, let's continue. So yes, now that we know that we've confirmed, right, that there are people that we don't know based on their IPs, right, that have established SSH sessions with our machine, we continue our investigation or our analysis, right? And we say, let us try to identify, like we said, are any scheduled tasks running on our machine that we don't know about, right? And as we can see, if you can see the screenshot clearly, you can see that, uh, you see at the bottom, at first we see that uh, in that home directory, there is a config RC directory slash A slash UPD that is running, right? And you're like, do, did I put this? 
we're not aware. And you can see, as you can see that, as I mentioned previously, it is set to run on reboot. So that means even when you reboot your computer, this script will start up automatically. And then the next one that is also set to run on reboot, you can see that in the tap directory, by the way, that is another trick that attackers can often try to hide files or scripts in your temp in that in the temp directory. So usually when you're looking for files that have no users that are assigned to them, you will probably find some files that have been hidden in your temp directory. So when you're making an investigation, it's usually won't hard for you to check what files, if any, are in the temp directory, right? So in this scenario, we can see that someone is running a script that is sent to run in that temp directory, and it is .x2a unix. It is vague, and it is not something we expect or that should be running. Typically, you should know that uh, you should know the scripts or the shadow tasks that are running in your system. Since you're the sysadmin, you know your system well. So you look at this and you're like, ah, this should not be running, right? And we go ahead and we say that, okay, now that we've identified, right, we go to report, which was uh, identification, right, or preparation. And then we're able to investigate from our traffic and we identify that somebody root forced our machine and got access. We're able to see that uh, they got SSH keys, right? And then we're able to analyze further and see that from this traffic, they have running SSH sessions on our computer, right? And then we can see that they're running some scheduled tasks that even run when we reboot that are doing some things that we don't know, right? And from the report, we know that we've been sending out tablet for such such attempts. So now that we know, oh, Abigaba is asking, can you can you explain that again? Or oh, what do you want us to explain kindly? Like I said, if there is anything that is a bit confusing or you don't get, please go ahead and ask. Oh. Abigail, what would you like us to? Okay, we got it. Awesome. So now that we know that there's some currents running and we know what is going on, the next step is to watch. From our um, chat, our next step would be see, we've done the preparation, we've done the detection and analysis, because from now the analysis, we know that somebody has SSH sessions. They are running cron jobs on our machine. So the next step is to quickly do what? Containment, eradication, and recovery. And so, so we go ahead and try to contain. So since we know that somebody has been searching and sending out brute force SSH attempts, right? First thing, one of the things that we could do, right, is to deny, to, to use firewall rules to maybe deny any port to traffic, any SSH traffic. As you can see here, uh, for this particular scenario, for the part of this webinar, we just went ahead and denied any TCP traffic going out of port 22 on our host. So we're saying that our file should drop any SSH traffic. Docas has a question. Docas, you can go ahead. It's also, uh, instead of denying SSH on port 22, it's always also advisable you change port 22 to any other port number that someone could not easily identify. So you could change yes. it maybe to 80, 40, 22 or something so that you can allow that changed port number to the, from the default to your new one. Great submission, Docas. Uh, one of the recommendations we're going to give in a later slide is that uh, as uh, after you contain it, to make sure that maybe it doesn't happen again, it's very advisable, even as part of your preparation, to change some of the basic ports that your service is running on. Because attackers know that maybe SSH is running on port 22. You can decide that from an institution, SSH is going to run on port A, B, C, D, right? depending on uh, your choice as an institution. Um, a great submission again, Dokas. Ramadan has something to say as well. Please go ahead. I wanted to ask, uh, as you, 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 you deny inactivity on port 22, 
and you, the, the system admin, had also configured that you would also uh, access it remotely. So would you still be having access as the, the, the owner of the, the, the system? Very good question. As you can see from the command, when you're writing firewall rules, you can specify whether to deny incoming or outgoing traffic, right? Remember for you as a sysadmin, if you require SSH, it's going to be incoming traffic into the server, right? It's traffic coming into your server. But remember, since right now we're trying to contain the incident, which in this case is that your server is being used to brute force people on the outside, right? To contain that, you can block outgoing traffic from your server. Does that make sense? As you can see, it is saying UFW, which is our firewall in this case, deny out, deny outgoing protocol TCP traffic and port 22. Does that make sense? Does that uh, clear it up a bit? Because usually, uh, actually, it's very, a very good thing to, break, uh, to bring up because usually you have, as a sysadmin, you have to be careful when you're containing and eradicating. Usually, later, as we'll see, in eradication, it's uh, a bit delicate. You have to make some tough decisions. But for now, in containment, the, as the next slide is going to show, As you can see, the NB there, all containment methods should be reversible, right? Since you're just containing, it's not advisable to you to just delete something out of the blue because as you're containing, it's still feeding back into investigation, right? So for now, you can just block uh, post 22 traffic that is outgoing. And you have to make sure that you're not locking yourself out because if you lock yourself out, how will you be able to investigate? Okay, uh, Ramadan says we're good to go. Uh, Grace, Edward, please go ahead and uh, submit as well. Yes, uh, after uh, you know changing the default uh, port, you can go ahead and uh, delete the cron job that uh, uh, you didn't uh, establish in your in, in your jobs. Because as we saw, yes. uh, there, are, uh, there are a couple of cron jobs, but there is one that is rogue uh, and it is uh, set on reboot. So you delete it accordingly. Yes, thank you, Edward. Uh, as we'll see in the next uh, few slides, we'll do we'll handle that as part of eradication. And yeah, I like the enthusiasm of my audience. Keep it up. Yes, so as we've identified, so now that we have it contained, right? Other ways that we can contain usually, because since uh, for this, for the purpose of this webinar, we focused on, uh, on SSH or an SSH scenario, but there are very many other scenarios. You know, it can be a ransomware incident, it can be a, a spamming incident, a phishing incident, and usually in containment, make sure the measures you put in place are reversible, right? So you can do something like, uh, for example, here we decided to, for now, deactivate outbound SSH traffic, right? To make sure someone cannot SSH outside anymore, right? For ransomware, you should isolate the affected host as part of containment because you don't want it to spread any further. And since you're containing, what you can do is uh, for now, for then, you can isolate that host. And later in the next slides, uh, next few slides, we'll talk about how you can do that. And um, there is a note there that is a bit funny, but very important. Note that shutting down your machine is not containment. Yes, at that moment, when you uh, maybe realize an incident, you might think that shutting down your mas machine is going to stop it from happening. But as you've seen, people put measures in place for persistence. A cron job is running or a shadow task is running that runs again once you with your machine. So that means shutting down your machine is not an option. It will not help you. You're supposed to actually have measures in place that contain it, that make sure it does not happen in place, which like our colleague Edward said, you can go ahead and make sure you delete cron jobs that you did not put in place as part of your containment. So thank you very much, Edward, for that submission. And if all else fails, consider escalating. 
because as they're containing or as you're investigating, actually as part of any stage in this process, right? If it fails, if you're doing the investigation, the analysis, uh, the containment, the eradication, and you feel like you're stuck or it has failed, well, please consider escalating to the Revenue Sat. We have a team of professionals that are here to help you. And uh, the email will be shared at the end, but it is such a training for SRCG. And so we go ahead. So now that we've contained, we know that at least the attack is not spreading or it's no longer going on. We have to eradicate. We have to make sure we erase any presence of this attack or this incident on our network, on our host, on our server, right? So for example, for a cron job, you can go ahead and delete the cron jobs, right? Like as I say, this can happen as part of both uh, containment and eradication. Delete the cron job, right? As we had seen, we had uh, from our cron job, he told us that there was a weird file running in our temp directory that we didn't know about, right? And it was running as a cron. So as part of eradication, we are going to go ahead and make sure we delete that file, right? And then after deleting that file, we have to make sure, as you can see from the screenshot, make sure that uh, that file no longer exists, right? So for other scenarios, let's say you had a malware incident, you have to make sure the malware or the script running the malware is deleted, any scheduled jobs are deleted, any files that are related to the incident are deleted that you did not put there, right? But it is, it is always important as you're doing the investigation take screenshots, take records that will help you in the report. As you can see, if we had not, or if the person that was carrying out this investigation had not taken screenshots or had not recorded the proceedings of their investigations, we would not be able to use this scenario to show you what went on, right? So it's important for you to make sure that, yes, as you're deleting, take some screenshots, take, save some copies of some of these files, but, there is caution there. For example, you have a malware that's an executable, a .exe or a .yaml file that's uh, being run on your machine. If you decide to do save a copy of it, make sure you're saving it as a .txt because you might decide to save your uh, .exe on another machine and you end up, end up just spreading malware. So take caution. If you do decide to save copies or to take screenshots or something, make sure you're saving the right copy so that you don't just contribute to spreading of this malware, please. Right, so eradication can involve a lot more things, right? You can run some anti-malware. There is a link there that uh, was provided. You can run maybe something like malware bytes to make sure that your machine is clean, change user passwords uh, to just to make sure if there are any suspicious users that you did not create, or the users that have been running those malicious scripts, malicious files, go ahead and delete them. But this is all after containment. You've contained it and you've made sure, you've made your investigation and analysis and you've come to backed up, backed up uh, conclusions, right? Not just assumptions. Remember initially, we were just making assumptions, but right now, since we've done an extensive investigation and analysis and we've contained and eradicated as part of eradication, we're going to make informed decisions like let's change the passwords, let's delete the suspicious users, delete these accounts, etc, etc. And same thing, if you feel like uh, you're having a roadblock or what you're doing is failing, please escalate to the Renaissance. So before we go ahead to the next step, which is going to be you know, recovery, now that we've eradicated, how do we recover? Right? Do we have any, any questions on eradication? Or any submissions, please. Uh, this is a webinar, it's a discussion. If you have any additions, please go ahead and submit. Mm -hmm. If not, you can let us know and uh, we can proceed. Uh, anything from my audience? I'm proud that I have an enthusiastic audience. So if anyone has anything to add or subtract, please go ahead, okay. I'm told to proceed, okay. Let's go ahead and proceed. So now that we've gone through the different stages, 
right? I, I always want to go back and refer to our stages, preparation, detection, analysis, containment, eradication, and recovery. So now that we've eradicated, how do we recover, right? That would be our next uh, stage in our presentation. And here, still, so you're going to make sure that you do not have any malware left, right? Like I said, please feed it to each other. Make run some anti malware a solution on your machine, be it a Windows machine, a Linux machine. There are different tools that you can run, and uh, we'll be able to provide some links. Uh, that's the end of the webinar. And uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. My colleague William or myself will provide some answers or some links. So as part of recovery, undo containment steps after testing that hold it back to normal, right? Remember, we said all containment steps should be what? Reversible. For example, for our scenario, we had to block outbound SSH traffic, right? But now that we know that we've deleted or erased any presence of the attacker or the incident on our, on our host, on our server, right? We've deleted cron jobs, we've deleted the user that it created, we've deleted, um, uh, we've deleted uh, the SSH keys that were giving him persistence, we've deleted all his files, all his scripts, and we've tested vigorously that everything is back to normal. We can go ahead and uh, unblock the traffic that we blocked for containment, right? If it was uh, maybe an email spamming incident and you had to deactivate the user account that was compromised, if now that you know that maybe you've changed the user's password, you've kicked out the attacker, you've done everything that needs to be done for eradication, you can go, go ahead and reactivate that user account, right? If it was maybe a system user on a Windows machine that you thought was compromised and you've done all the remediations, you've run some anti-malware, like malware bytes, the malware is gone, you've deleted all the persistence, et cetera, you can go ahead and maybe reactivate that user, right? So if you've undone the containment steps, then in case, because in case let's say it was a ransomware incident, right? And a lot of your data had been encrypted, right? Okay, Armadan is asking if it was an email and you suspend the email status, would, be, would that be a measure as well? For example, if you had, uh, let's say you realize that uh, an email account on your email server or any email system had been compromised and it was using to send out spam, usually you as a system admin, if you have access, you can just go ahead and maybe change the password to kick out the attacker and then confirm that uh, maybe um, this spam is no longer going out. But as the admin, as you're doing this to contain before you maybe you do other investigations, you can decide to first deactivate that account. You can let, let this user know that uh, maybe your account has been sending out so-and-so and we're investigating, we are going to deactivate your account maybe for three hours or maybe for an hour, right? As a measure of safety. And then you can go ahead and carry out your investigation, the analysis and eradication, and then you can reverse it, reactivate the account, get them back to normal operation. Okay, Ramadan has something to add. You can go ahead. So I, want, I wanted to ask, in, for example, still on the issues of the email, uh, you get alerts that uh, a suspicious login uh, was made on a particular email from a known device. Would that be a cause of alarm? Yes, as a system mean, if you get an e yes, an email like that, usually the best for the back then is to ask the user themselves, right? Ask them that I've received uh, an email that let's say your email account has been accessed uh, from Russia or from a device that has never accessed it, was this you? If the answer is yes, then maybe tell them, okay, just make sure you do it safely, maybe use a VPN or something of the sort, 
If the answer is no, then that is cause for a lot of alarm because that means if the user is not the one that accessed it, that is confirmation of an incident, then you have to go ahead and start your investigation and see, maybe change the password, et cetera. Does that answer your question? Ramazan, are we okay? Good. Uh, we can go ahead. Please, if you have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and let us know. Okay. As we had said, for example, if it's a ransomware incident, like we said in preparation, it is very important to have a backup, a well tested backup system set up. Because let's say we know that no matter how vigilant you are, sometimes you might be hit by something that. Uh, you cannot do anything about, for example, you hit by ransomware, maybe out of no fault of your own, you've done as much as you can, but if the attacker has just outfought you, or maybe it was uh, an uh, advanced organization that uh, established a, a series of attacks, or maybe one of the servers you are using had not yet been patched by the, by the manufacturer and you've been hit by ransomware. So this is the time that your backups come in, right? you can restore from your backups that are up to date, which feeds back into making sure that if you have a backup strategy, it should be well tested and regular, right? If you decide that maybe I have um, a learning management system or I have an email system and I'm going to back it up every weekend or maybe twice every week, make sure this strategy is tested and maybe every once in a while, maybe every month, check to see that the backups actually exist and I can actually restore from these backups, okay? Then uh, as part of recovery, uh, changes of password, insufficient user, et cetera. If anything fails, you can reach out to the Reddit search for guidance or help. So now that we've finished our containment, eradication, and recovery, we head into post-incident activities. Yes, we've gone through this, we've received, we've received the report, we've investigated, analyzed, contained, eradicated, recovered. It's been a very long, long process, right? What next? Usually it's time to have uh, harder conversations with yourself, your team, your management, right? And, uh, uh, as part of these next few slides, we're going to provide a few tips that you can follow back at home to make sure that you're secure or things like this don't happen frequently. Uh, Ramadan has, Ramadan, you have your hand raised again. Please go ahead. Sorry, sorry for coming back first and we are back and forth. I wanted to, you said that, uh, yes, one of the recovery process is now maybe uh, bring, getting, uh, uh, getting back your up-to-date uh, backup. And, but now, assuming that an incident happened or you've, you've not detected the incident, but then in the whole process, you've done the backup in that, a backup that was scheduled has, 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 has been done. And then the compromise, would you have, would, when that process is happening, would you, be compromising the backup as well? Okay, good question. So yeah, that's usually uh, when you're backing up, yes, it's important to back up from the most up-to-date, but also the most usable backup that's available. Because you might find that, yes, you have uh, a backup, right? You have an update, um, an up-to-date backup, let's say that one was made yesterday, but maybe your backup has been compromised as well. But maybe you have a backup from a month ago as well, but that backup is okay. So that, that would mean that that is the most usable up-to-date backup that you're going to have to restore from. But that also feeds back into having a well-tested backup system. Realistically speaking, your backup should be independent, right, from your systems. That means even if you're compromised, your backup should be set up in a way that even when you're compromised, your backup is not compromised. Does that make sense, right? Or that there are multiple copies of it out there. That means that when you're backing up, 
the backups should not necessarily just delete the previous backups. Backups are usually cumulative, right? So that you know that um, in case the most recent backup that I made on Sunday happens to contain malware as well, or happens to contain ransomware or has been compromised as well, I know that the cumulative backups before that, the backup that I made the previous week is still good to go. So it is the use of the most up-to-date usable backup that's available. Does that answer your question? It feeds us back into making sure that your backup system is very well thought of and uh, very well tested and making sure that the best case scenario or the best practice is to make sure that it's uh, cumulative. Because imagine if you're having a, a backup that just overwrites what you already have that scenario would be catastrophic because that means you'd have a compromised backup as well and you'd not be able to recover. So usually, cumulative is how we go. Sandra is asking, how do I use Farmhouse and how do I activate it? Sandra, we're going to actually touch a bit of that in our next, in this slide. Yes. Uh, Chirotwo is uh, saying that I think it's just a matter of having proper backup procedures. And yes, that is very correct, as I just said. Uh, okay, now let's talk about our post incident activities, right? Some of this, let's say we're going to talk about a bit about for emails, for network, and for hosts. For emails, after you've been hit and before you've been hit. So in preparation and in post incident, like we say, this is continuous. This is supposed to be, be done now before an incident happens, but can also be done in the process of an incident in the, uh, as the incident is occurring and after an incident, right? So right now, what we can do, what will be homework for you is to set up things like enabling spam filters to prevent phishing emails from reaching the end users in the first place. Because usually, uh, as we can see, one of the things we can do for end users is to do awareness, right? But no matter how much as you as a system as admin, systems admin tries to teach your users, they might fall for a few clever phishing tactics, right? So you as a as sys admin, that's where defense in depth comes in, right? Where you know that um, you're going to put up a spam filter to minimize or to make sure very few, if any, spam emails or phishing emails get to my users, right? And that is where you can put up, uh, you can use uh, repeatable email filters or blacklists like Spam House. My colleague William has shared uh, a link in the, in the chat of what Spam House is and what you can use. And what these um, filters usually do is that when you set up this filter, let's say in your email gateway, right? Or in your email system, when you receive or when your user receives an email, that has already been marked by this repeatable filter as a spam email or this sender or this IP has already been marked as a, an, a sender of spam or phishing emails, your email gateway or your filter will, will drop this email so that it doesn't reach your end user to tempt them to flee whatever is in it, right? Second, you can scan all incoming and outgoing emails to detect and filter executable files from reaching end users. Same thing, you can set up a filter that scans any files or any attachments that have been put on your emails to make sure that your end users are not duped. And you can scan and filter or download from your emails. So as you can see from the screenshots, there is an example. You can see that, let's say, spam at example.com was sending it to a victim in your company. And they were saying that the, the subject is an invoice. So let's say they're sending to a member of your finance department and telling them that an invoice for Feb, that, that. And they're saying, good morning. Please see the attached invoice and repeat payment. Thank you. So as you can see the email, it looks like at face value for somebody that has not been trained, it looks like it's a legit email, right? It's an invoice for Feb related to me, a finance person. And that person might just go ahead and click, right? Click on that invoice to see, okay, let me see the invoice. 
but then click on clicking on that invoice, they might end up getting malware on their laptop, which will then get from their laptop or from their machine and spread to the rest of your network, right? So that's why it's important to make sure that we as a sys admin, things like this don't get to, the, to your users in the first place, right? And if they do, that is why user awareness comes in. That if this maybe my spam filter has led to a few things, my users should know that when you receive an email that has an attachment, first check to confirm that the from is this email coming from a person I know I am expecting from a domain that's known. If the answer is yes, okay. Am I receiving any invoice from these people? Why is these people not referring to me by name if they are sending this invoice to me? There are a few indicators that a person can always look out for, right? From to maybe, are there any links in the email? If I hover over the link, not clicking, but hovering over the link, is it a suspiciously, you know, shortened link or something of the likes, right? Those are some of the things that you can teach your users also we'll discuss later. But for now, you as a sysadmin, for the first three depth, you have to set up measures to make sure that these things do not reach your end users in the first place, okay? Sandra is asking, can known persons also transfer malware? How can you detect it via email? So yes, in case an account, a user account has been compromised, a person from your, um, a person that already has an account, a person that you already know, can be able to send your users, you know, files that have malware. That's why it's uh, important to stay vigilant. It's always about having different measures in place, right? Because for this to happen, that means someone might, might start compromise maybe your email server, they compromise an account, and then they use an account to send malware to people in your company, right? And uh, the best way to detect it is if you do not have a spam filter in place or anything like that, it might be a bit hard for you to detect that uh, there is malware in this email, especially if it is coming from an expected source. Let's say me, myself, are sending an email to my colleague William, right, with an attachment that has malware. It might be a, hit, a bit harder for William to know that Gideon is sending me malware. Right? unless he knows for a fact that my account has been compromised. Or if William is vigilant, what you can advise what, when you're training your users, if you use, let's say William is vigilant, he will first ask me, did you have received an email from you with an attachment? What is it about? If, if William isn't expecting any emails from me, of course, and then he sees an email from me at 3 a.m. to first, before he checks what it is, of course, but ask me, did you have you sent me an email that I'm not expecting? Because if somebody has compromised an account, it becomes a bit harder to detect. I hope that answers your question, Sandra. Like we said, it's always about uh, being vigilant, you know, having the different layers of protection in place, not just having a secure machine, you know, by maybe having SSH keys for authentication, but also going inside, having firewall, firewalls in place, then on your email server itself, making sure that you have filters for, for emails, then inside have making sure there is user awareness so your users don't fall for you know, any phishing tactics, et cetera. Uh, does anybody else have anything to add or any questions, subtractions, and uh, prevention strategies for emails? Uh, at this stage, since we're just giving recommendations, uh, it's um, an open discussion. If you have anything to add that you feel that other members of the webinar can benefit from, you can go ahead and type it or raise your hand and I will let you speak. How does Pam Filter or Spam House notify you that the info you receive is not safe? So Sandra, as you'll see when you click the link, when you set up that filter, right? The way it works is that when your email gateway receives this email in the first place, and it checks against a list of already known fraudulent, maybe IPs or emails from Spam House, and it sees that maybe this IP or email is already on that list, it will automatically drop that email so that it does not go to your user in the first place. So these people have a list of IPs that have already been marked to be spending, sending out spam. So when you receive an email from an IP like that or from an email like that, it will be compared to that list, and if it is there, that it will be dropped. 
that's the way it usually works in simplified terms. Sandra, does that answer your question? Arthur is asking, what are some of the best strategies for keeping users aware? We know as much as systems are hacked, people are hacked through social engineering tactics. How do we deal with the human firewall? Yes, Arthur, that's one of the things that we we'll discuss in some of our last slides. So for now, let's uh, first continue to network prevention strategies. So, so for networks, usually you can have things in place like you know, segmenting your network, which can be done in a couple of ways, right? You can maybe uh, do subnetting, you can create VLANs and make sure that uh, if something happens, if a user in a particular VLAN is compromised or does something malicious, it cannot affect other users. Let's say you know that you have students who are maybe on the internet doing things that you don't know, and then you have uh, maybe uh, administration that have that have that access critical systems. You can actually you can decide and say that okay, let me create a VLAN for students so that that no matter what they do, if maybe a student is compromised and it leaks into uh, the network, at least I know that the administration VLAN is not going to be compromised and my systems in the administration VLAN will be safe, right? So that's a, a, an example of how you can make sure that uh, you have prevention in place, creating VLANs. And this can be used to slow down malware propagation, right? Having this like the segmentation, subnetting, VLANing, you will know that in case this subnet is affected, in case this VLAN is affected, it will not spread to the rest of my network or it will slow it down because of that uh, segmentation. And also filter malicious networks also help in isolating. Like we said, let's say you have ransomware, a way that you can actually um, contain it is to maybe um, put that infected machine in an isolated VLAN. I'd right? say so you can create a DMC in your VLAN and just put that machine there for investigation so that you can be able to investigate it without being scattered to affect the rest of your network, right? Okay, yes, like William has said, we shall discuss uh, some methods, prevention. So this first one was, you know, building that basic incident response resilience, okay, or know-how. And tomorrow, so that's why okay, it's very important for you to attend tomorrow's webinar, we're going to go in depth of how you can implement some of these things, how you can make sure that, uh, you know, you can secure your network, some of the tools you can use, some of the services that are offered that can help you. But for now, some of the other things you can do is patching operating systems, as easy as it sounds, it's very important. Usually, making sure that your systems are patched and up to date, or the firmware is okay, application software, that will often help you or prevent any incidents, right? Because usually attacks arise from systems that are not patched. You may be running, let's say, an Apache Tomcat server, a Wozniak server, an Apache server, and you find that you've, uh, you've been hacked just because the manufacturer or the developer had sent out an update or a patch because, uh, because usually when you see that there is an update, some people might say, ah, I'm tired of Windows updates. Or I'm tired of updates that are coming out all the time. But think about it this way. If the person that is developing this system or this software, this firmware is saying that I'm sending out a patch or an update. It means there is something they know or that they've seen that you don't know, right? So it's usually important for you to have a bit of trust in the person whose software you're using. I know that there is a reason why they're sending out this part of the software. Maybe they've, uh, they've realized or identified a security flaw that can be used by attackers to hack you or to compromise you. So if you see that there is a patch available, please do it, but usually it's advisable for you to have maybe a test environment where you can test them, because if you have a production systems that uh, deliver critical services, it's also not advisable to just, you know, deploy these patches, because sometimes these patches come out or these updates, but they have a few flaws because they've not been, not been tested properly. So you could have like a test environment if you have uh, properly set up production systems, have a test environment where you can say, okay, there is a patch, let me test it for like a day or two, to make sure that the service is still running as normal. And if it is, I'm going to deploy it into my production systems. 
And it's usually, it doesn't hurt to have like a centralized fact management system set up. Okay, and then you can have regular security auditing through automated scans. This is another very important thing because usually the best way for you to know a lot of the things we've been saying today, we've been saying you already know what's going on in your system. So if something happens, you know that something has changed. But how do you know? One of the ways you can know is carrying out sec uh, regular security audits. It can be a vulnerability scan, it can be a penetration test to know that uh, it can even be uh, an automated regular scan. You can say that maybe I'm running a vulnerability scan on my network, on my servers every month or every quarter or every week to make sure that if there is anything, if there is any outdated software, any, uh, any things that have not yet patched, any vulnerabilities that have been identified in maybe the last week, the last month, the last quarter, I should be in the know as a system that me. So it's very important to do uh, regular security auditing. And that is one of the things that will be talked about tomorrow. So never to attend. Then you can virtualize services if we have it, right? If you know that maybe have a, a service that's running on a server, it might be a bit easier for you to recover because you can say, okay, let me just spin up another VM and, and you know, uh, spin up my backup to get service up and running. It might be a bit easier than if you had that service running on a, an actual physical server and it has been hacked and you have to do uh, ABCD to, you know, like make sure it's contained, eradicated, then maybe format it and set up the service again. But if you're your services are virtualized, it may be a bit easier to, to spin up another VM and just you know bring back your backup and have business running like it never happened, right? So it's also recommended to virtualize some of your services if, if it is possible, right? Then maintain an off-site backup for of crucial key servers and data, right? The keyword there is off-site, right? Because if uh, let's say your site is hit with malware. And your backup is on site, you might end up with a backup that is compromised as well, like Ramadan had said, right? Previously, it's important to have an off site backup, knowing that if for some reason I'm hit and I have no access to anything on site, I know that at least I have a backup that has been, you know, tested, has been going on an up to date off site. So I can just maybe spin up a VM, deploy those services on there, and have maybe my administration get back to work as we continue with investigations of the likes. Because the thing about the um, detrimental things about incidents usually is that it will happen, but your administration or your students or the employees of your organization will still want to do business, right? The business does not stop just because an incident has occurred. So that's why it's important to have maybe an offside backup so that if something happens as you're still investigating, you can run from your backup and have business running back as normal. So next is just a, a sample, an example uh, network setup that you know, you'd say that, okay, this is an example of a secure network or a network that's been set up properly. You can see, you know, somebody uh, traffic is coming from the internet, where you bought a router, and then between it and uh, the router that feeds the organization, there's going to be an intrusion protection system, grid detection. You have a web filter, which can be like um, an application filter. Um, you have uh, different networks. You can see there is an employee network, there is a guest and mobile network, there is a quarantine network for tests, and there is a data center network. So that's the VLAN that we're talking about, knowing that if something happens in the guest network, because a guest might come on your network, you give them a password, and then they do something malicious and you end up being affected. So, but if you know that there is a guest network, Whatever guests do, it's not going to affect my employees and it's going to affect my data center network. You can see that you have NetFlow set up to know that you know I have eyes in what's going on in my network. You know, I can see the traffic so that I can analyze it, right? So you can have those tools like NetFlow set up. My colleague William will expand tomorrow, expand more tomorrow. Uh, you have your data center with your security tools, data servers, etc. It's just a sample, you know, secure network that you can see. But uh, different people have different setups. But the concept, the basic concepts remain the same, right? Make sure you have maybe an application filter setup, have a firewall, have a monitoring setup, maybe have some segmentation in place, etc., etc. Then 
we go to one of the most important things, like um, I think Edward had asked end users, usually no matter what you do as a, an end user, you say you're as only as strong as your weakest link and your weakest link in any system is usually the user, right? So it's important to make sure that end user awareness is done the right way, right? So some of the things that you can um, uh, enforce are things like strong password policies, multi-factor authentication and critical systems. Usually um, people can say that, okay, let's say I have multi-factor authentication and strong passwords. I cannot maybe have all these many strong passwords in my head. So factor authentication, what if I don't have my phone? And yes, it's understandable that it can become a bit frustrating. But the thing about security is that it's usually a line, a, a graph, right? Where you have to find uh, a compromise between convenience and security. So you as a system, you have to ask yourself, would I rather have my users be, you know, like access my system very conveniently, but they are non-secure? Or I'll make it a bit inconvenient, but I know my systems are secure. Whereby I know that for a person, let's say, to access um, my finance management system or my ERP, they have to have a strong password that maybe has a minimum of 12 characters, some uppercase letters, some special characters, some numbers, right? And then on top of that, after entering their password, they have to receive an authentication code, maybe a six letter or four letter code on their email or maybe on their phone number as SMS and then they enter that code to get access, right? That is all defense in depth. And you as a sysadmin, you have to set these things up and sensitize your users on how to use them and on how it's going to help them and the organization, right? And then of course, no matter, it's always important to make sure that there is anti-malware and antivirus solutions installed on your costs, right? PCs and the likes. Especially if you're using operating systems like Windows, you have to make sure that uh, you regularly check that your anti-malware solutions and antivirus solutions are not only installed, but they're up to date, right? Then of course, it's as long as all the time, regularly patch and install your systems with security updates on all the user devices, right? And then some things that we can add, you can suggest a few browsers, you know, because we have some browsers that do not put security first, but you can recommend that users have properly set up Firefox browsers when they access critical systems, because you know that they put security a bit in front. They could have a few extensions enabled on those browsers, like maybe disabling scripts, enforcing you know, HTTPS to make sure that they only visit secure sites. Uh, and if you have, if you're giving your users uh, maybe devices to access while at work, you can make sure that maybe user thumb drives is disabled, etc. It's not an exhaustive list, but there are a lot of things. As you can see on the screen, there are a few links, right? YouTube links to some past SAT webinars where these topics were, because like I said, the topic for this webinar is basic incident response for the constituency. But in past webinars, we've gone in depth on um, security awareness, post best training and the likes. And um, those links or those YouTube links can offer a lot more knowledge on some of those past webinars. I see a number of questions. Uh, okay, uh, Mugumia asked and uh, the links are there and we're going to share them in the chat as well for all the material from the past webinar and the material from this webinar as well will be shared and uh, at the end of the webinars, uh, of these two webinars, recordings of these webinars as well will be shared. Yes, um, for now, that is all the content we have. If you have anything cybersecurity related or as at any point in your incident, whether at the start, if you're just making your incident response plan and you feel like you need help from the Renault start, Please don't hesitate to reach out in case you're um, you, an incident and you're just you know investigating it, identifying it, analyzing it, maintaining it, eradicating it, recovering. And you feel like at any stage you need help, you can escalate to the Renaissance site and we'll be here and happy to help. The email is very easy, such at renew.ac.ug. And if for some reason you're unable to get the email, 
The SAT has a website as well. You can go to the Renault site and you'll be able to reach us. And yes, uh, without further ado, I'm going to open the discussion to move, to open the floor to discussion from the rest of the atten attendees and from my co-host, William. Um, I think we still have a bit more time or, oh, actually it's 12. So I think we've exhausted our time, but uh, if you guys, if any of you or all of us come to a consensus that maybe we can add a few more minutes and we want to have a discussion, please go ahead and raise your hand or type in the chat anything else that you want us to talk about before we close our webinar. Otherwise, that is all the content that was prepared for today. Uh, Ismail has raised his hand. Ismail, go ahead and talk. Uh, greetings, Stu. Greetings. Yeah, I have a bit of a technical request or uh, taking you back to your example of the uh, remote uh, SSH exploit. Yes. Uh, I was trying to look at your uh, steps where you, after detection and then the containment and then the um, uh, measures to take to, to, uh, to prevent a future occurrence. So I don't yes. know whether I missed it, but from the examples you've highlighted, it, it is not very clear to me how the user, from your perspective, how the user compromised the machine in the first place and uh, how, how we are going about to prevent that. This is just towards the end, maybe you hinted, maybe the password was the issue, but I thought maybe you'd throw some light on how, how the attack originated in the first place. How, how such a scenario comes up uh, where a machine gets, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, penetrated and then someone installs uh, that malicious hardware that would uh, cause an uh, SSH or brute attack to another server or PC. Okay, Isma, thank you for the question. Let's go a bit back. As we previously uh, said, as you can see from the screenshot, we did a small investigation on SSH logs to first identify any people that were trying to gain access to our server. And as we saw, people from different IPs were trying to gain access using a number of users, but they were unsuccessful. But then we were able to go and see that if any user was accepted and we saw that an, a password was accepted for Sophia from that, from that IP. We know that the IP is not ours, but the user Sophia exists. And we assumed, and we said, that let's make an assumption that maybe a brute force attempt, as we can see that brute force attempts were already being made and one of them was successful. That means that this person made a number of attempts using different passwords because this this thing on an attacker's side can be automated somebody can say that the user sophia try out these one million passwords to see if any of them are correct and if for some reason sophia had a password like password one two three four which as funny as it sounds we still find people that have passwords like that one two three four password and if that password belonged on any of the lists that this attacker was using, of course, this attacker would find the password and they would be able to gain access to our server using that user, Sophia. So as we had said, that is how the attacker, we were able to come to see that that is how the attacker gained access to our machine. Does that answer your question, Ismail? I think maybe you joined a bit late and you missed it, but we would uh, gone through the scenario as part of our investigation and we'd seen that there, was a brute, there were brute force attempts on our server and a password had been accepted for a user called Sophia from an unknown IP, which was the basis where we knew that maybe someone gained access to our server, which made us go ahead to look for any traffic on port 22 which then showed us that there were established sessions on our server on, port, on the SSH port, SSH sessions, 
which then led us to seeing if any shadow jobs were running, which then led us to containment, and then to eradication, and then recovery, and then where we are now. Ismail, does that okay. answer your question? Yeah, so, so um, if, if I'm to understand, under the recovery, under an mitigation, uh, we have, uh, we have strong password, uh, strong password uh, recommendation. And then uh, my assumption is that these users are um, not coming in via the email, but uh, these are users who we added onto the server as, yes. as uh, either standard user. Yes. And then um, the other thing I'm picking up is that uh, uh, when, you, when, you, when you did the containment, um, you are you have the option of either removing the 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 rule at some point or you can leave as is however i thought maybe you could also limit and add a line saying that uh, let me have people come in from from non from non uh, networks uh, as a, because if these are people standard users on your on your perfect uh, yes yeah yes so like i said it's, it's, it's a Yes, it's a discussion and uh, yes, there are a number of ways that you can contain. We cannot exhaust them in just two hours, but yes, as part of containment, let's say if the attack was coming into your network, you can uh, put a firewall rule and restrict access to only users from certain subnets in your network or even just your network or particular subnets from your network or particular villains in your network. That will also uh, be under containment. Anything else this month? Yes, uh, to add on uh, what Ismail was saying, uh, that shows you that uh, there are a number of ways. Like I said, every stage of this process has a lot of things that are going on, right? In investigation, there are a number of things you can do in um, analysis, there are a lot of things you can do in what, when you're containing, it can be on a per scenario basis, depending on what you're facing. There are a number of things you can do. And that is why the advisor is to, you know, uh, do a thorough investigation because you feel as an investigation feeds into containment. If you've done a thorough investigation, usually to show you maybe what you need to do to contain it for them. And if you cannot identify it, that is why the community is here. You can already reach out to a friend at a member institution, uh, escalate the issue to the of side for us to be able to help because uh, cybersecurity is a very wide space and collaboration is very important. So if there is anything you ever face and you don't understand what's going on, you hit a roadblock, please always seek for help. Don't die alone. We are always here to help. Okay, Moses has his hand up as well. Uh, you can go ahead, Moses. Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, thank you very much for a good discussion, but um, I had a question. Uh, if, if maybe you could be via me or maybe have a way of... Now, uh, I, have two, I have two concerns, and one is a question. Okay. Uh, if I'm running, uh, let's say, a website, how can I uh, stop, um, how can I hide the technology, like uh, build, is to build this, uh, this site uh, from these online scanners, uh, you know, we can scan and know which technology was used to build a given platform, or it was a content management system. For example, uh, Wagtail for Python users, and, uh, and also a WordPress for people used with HTML, CSS, and PHP. We have also Zippo, is also there. Uh, we have, um, uh, have a number of them. But how can I hide, uh, like for security reasons, 
you could hide, if there is a way how you can hide the technology behind a given uh, website or a system or something, because this result into a security uh, weak point, because some of these sites are well known, uh, their login, uh, their login pages, there some of them even there, um, their admin that you can change. It's okay, but just knowing uh, their login path and also some other known pages like the update page in um, in, in group of this can cause a security threat because some of them are public and know. So can I hide, can I have a way how I can hide something like that? The second uh, thing is, um, uh, uh, can I, uh, because on, on the C panel that we normally uh, get from Renew has uh, uh, a given SSL certificate, how can we use this SSL certificate on, a, on another, another platform like I have a VM which is running Tomcat, how can I use that SSL certificate on, on Tomcat? Because so far I've seen it can work with Apache, but Tomcat uh, it has it has a little bit some technical issues. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Moses. So to answer the first question, first of all, it's recommended that you always and always change default password for any system or any site that you get, be it Drupal, WordPress, name it, even a Linux system, Windows system, even any system that Renu gives you, it's advisable. And every time Renu sets up an email for you, I think the email always says it's advisable for you to change the password that we provided, right? That should be best practice back at home. For any system, any website, anything you, you set up or access, please change the default credentials, right? Then when it comes to uh, web crawlers, one, not wanting web crawlers to find you, usually you could play around with files, uh, ht access, the .ht access file, but most importantly, there is a file called the robots.txt, robots.txt file. So when this, the way the internet works is that when these web crawlers are looking for things on the internet, those are the files that they usually look for to know what they're allowed to access and show people on your site and what they're not allowed to. So when you're setting up a website, it's important to properly set up your robots.txt file, right? First of all, hide it from people so that it's not accessible online. Then second, make sure that you set it up to know that only information that you want to be accessible should be accessible and other information should not be accessible when people peruse your site so it's about properly setting up your robots your txt and .ht access file right then for the second question when it comes to ssl certificates yes there is a way for you to have a certificate that you can deploy on multiple servers and for that i would recommend that you tune in tomorrow and also, you can reach out to Renu because uh, Renu provides a service for SSL certificates where we can offer you a wild card that you will be able to deploy on all your servers using one certificate. So I think that answers your questions. Uh, in case of anything else, don't hesitate to reach out. I see a couple of other people that have some questions as well. There is. Uh, uh, there is Sun and there is Norman uh, Moses. I don't know. I see your hand is still up. I don't know if you have a question. Okay, you're done. Okay, Sun, you can go ahead uh, and uh, speak. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, the the current, uh, this, uh, the person who asked a question about uh, hiding the. Uh, Hiding the theme and the login pages and maybe the plugins that are used for uh, maybe the content management system. I would like to uh, hear a um, and tell her that for content management systems like uh, WordPress, uh, she can play around with plugins uh, to actually uh, hide uh, the theme, maybe the logins uh, for, the, for the websites. 
uh, so that whenever someone puts uh, maybe the link to the detectors or the scanning uh, softwares, they can't find uh, the technology she actually used. So there are some WordPress plugins. There is um, she can actually play around with a uh, WP Hide. It's a WordPress plugin, and then uh, there is also another one. It's a uh, WP Hide and Security Enhancer. Actually, that one will uh, those two plugins will help her if if actually she's using WordPress, they will help her hide the theme and the logins and the details of the of the website. She doesn't want people to view. She doesn't want people to view her details of the website and the technology she used. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for the submission, Sam. That uh, that was great. Uh, Norman. Uh, you're next, uh, you can go ahead and talk to us as well. Well, thank you so much, Gideon. I think Son has uh, partially tackled what I wanted to, to advise our colleague Moses, but maybe since it is an open discussion, we can also dive into discussing plugins. I wanted to add on to uh, Son's, those days that uh, Son uh, tackled, there is also another popular plugin called uh, WordFence, which uh, provides for, it is a web application firewall, and it also provides for scanning, blocking, and also hiding some of those things that you wouldn't want um, attackers to access. So since it is an open discussion, we can explore that and also hear from you, technocrats from, from Renu, you can also give us the, the 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 advice that we can take moving forward thank you yes uh, thank you norman and thank you son as well once again so yes uh plugins for especially uh, quantum management systems a number of people make plugins for wordpress drupal etc uh but uh, you should be cautious right uh, and always make sure that before using a plugin, you do enough research about it, you know, see the uh, reviews from people that have used it before, because usually reviews will tell you if it is working as expected or not. And most importantly, always, always install patches and updates when they're available for plugins, because most attacks for content management systems like plugin, group, or the likes actually come through those plugins, right? But these people are always sending out that updates. So it's up to you as a system to make sure that if you've decided to use a plugin, right, for any reason, because there are a number of reasons you might want to use a plugin, including this particular one of hiding things that you want people to see on your website, on your site, make sure that you always update, right? They'll probably send you an email, but that admin, that person admin, you're always checking your website, so always show you a notification that there is an update available. Please, please install it whenever it is available. I think, I don't know if Moses, it's a mistake or you have something else to say, but in case you do, please go ahead. Once again, thank you, Norman. Moses, do you have something else to say or is that another fine mistake? Um, hello. Let me try again. Madam, I want to try Renu. I want to try Renu. Hello. Renu. Oh. Yes. Hello. Oh, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for the for the uh, reply and some questions uh, regarding the scanning yes. and those are uh, open source um, open source content management systems. Uh, Maybe mm -hmm. what I would like to require mm -hmm. is about the firewall, this simple mm -hmm. one, the one we normally use, the UFW. Um, I don't know whether it could be possible that um, allow a certain certain MAC address, mm -hmm. uh, since the MAC address is a level two, I don't know, can I use a firewall to, um, uh, to filter MAC addresses of, of devices because it would be good if I allow known computers to SSH to my server using their MAC addresses because they don't normally change. IP addresses can change or the range of IP addresses. Like we saw in your example, a certain IP address uh, was granted access. Uh, to a given server, 
So in such a case, if there was a use of a MAC address, then it would be like a known computer is the one which is uh, allowed to enter into a given uh, server. Thank you. Submission as well, madam. Yes, uh, keep, uh, keep the additions coming in. Uh, this is uh, right now we're in an open discussion. So yes, uh, if you could go ahead to add an extra layer and uh, configure that only certain MAC addresses are allowed access to your server. That is also um, a very good security measure. If let's say you have a, a very critical server and you want, let's say, by only two people, maybe senior systems admin, two senior systems admin to have access to it, you can configure that only these two machines, maybe even the systems admin are not allowed to access it through their machines, but there are two machines at office that are configured that are allowed to access this particular server, you can configure and restrict it to those two MAC addresses. So yes, thank you very much for the submission. Uh, anybody else that has uh, good James uh, of knowledge to add? Please let us know. Uh, if not, we can get ready to close our webinar. Uh, Dorcas, uh, please go ahead, you've been allowed. Uh, when it comes to email, it's also recommended that you always monitor your mail queue so that you can really be in position to understand who is sending out and then also have daily mail reports where you can know that Gideon sent out about 50 emails in a particular day at a particular time. And that will then help you in analyzing and trying to monitor your traffic and know what people and how much people send out. Because when you're in position to monitor your queue, you can even get to understand that you can easily get blocked or blacklisted by certain domains so that you can really counter the adverse effects that would come by being blocked by certain providers. Something else? that uh, all of us can add to our arsenal. You can put up uh, some monitoring for email queues so that you know what is expected from your users, maybe in a particular day, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody else that wants to offer us some gems that we all need these? Like I said, remember, the community of cybersecurity is open and it uh, depends on collaboration. So every time you have something that you feel that other people need to know, please never hesitate to share. If you want the rest of the community to know, you can send it to the Renaissance and uh, be able to broadcast it to the rest of the community. Oh, and by the way, the Renaissance has a, a Twitter handle for those that uh, follow social media where you can always find uh, some knowledge of things that are going on in uh, the cybersecurity community that maybe you might, you and people around you might need to know or that might benefit yourself and your institution. I think my colleague William will share the handle for now, but uh, it will be touched as well tomorrow. And uh, if we do not have any more questions, so, uh, additions, discussions. I would like to thank you for being an amazing audience, for being engaging, for being enthusiastic, for uh, sparing your time to come and learn with us. Remember, this is a learning process that never ends. So I'd like to, to advise you to stay vigilant. Uh, uh, these slides will be shared to the, for those who need them. Recordings will be available and uh, I'd recommend that uh, if you do not have any incident response plan already set up back at home at your institution, please start the conversation with your management. We can start it internally in your IT department to at least know that uh, if something happens, where do we start from? If our email server is compromised, if, our, if server AB is compromised, if we identify this, who handles this? Maybe internally, maybe you know we have a stack of three who handles what, how do we go about it? How do we escalate it to management? Because usually during an incident, 
you need to alert people that are affected. How do we escalate to the renaissance in case we need help? This is the time for you to actually go and start the process of you know, setting up these things and some of the recommendations that we provided for prevention, be it for email, network, posts, please go ahead and uh, you know, start making sure that some of those things are in place. Set up strategies for end user awareness. You can start internally with your staff, with your IT staff, uh, and so much more. Uh, once again, thank you for your time. Uh, I'll submit the floor back to my colleague, William, and uh, if he has anything to say, and we'll get ready to wish you all a good afternoon. William, do you have something else to say? Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our audience for being so participative. Uh, they've been um, talking things that um, everyone, I think, always agrees on. Uh, so it has been quite engaging, and I think this is going to be fruitful moving forward to tomorrow's meeting uh, or webinar where we're going to discuss more of these things based on how we can contribute to them uh, well. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you again for taking your time for giving us this good information. And um, hopefully it is now going to cascade the members to, to be empowered to actually do these things. So I'd like to thank everyone for, for being here and let's meet back here again tomorrow at 10.